Welcome to the Marconi Project, an oral history series of the Italian American Museum of Washington, D.C. In these interviews, we capture the memories and experiences of Italian immigrants and Italian Americans in the nation's capital. We are ready to hear your story. Omar, just if you would state your name, where you were born, where you lived most of your life. My name is Omero Sabatini. Actually, you wouldn't know it from my accent, but I was born in this country. I was taken by my mother to Italy when I was three and a half, but we always spoke Italian at home. I knew a few coarse words here and there, but uh, no English. And then uh, I lived in Italy until my early 20s. First in Abruzzo, well, in Abruzzo, then I went, graduated from the University of Rome. And uh, right after that, I came back to this country. Since I was born in East Chicago, Indiana, and my father was there, I went there to, the, uh, to live for a few days. And then I enrolled at the University of Chicago and stayed in, there for a couple of years. Then I moved to New York to work for Reader's Digest, at the advertising department of Reader's Digest. And uh, that was in about 58 or so, 1958. Then in 1962, I came down here to work for, uh, to Washington, to work for the US government. I first worked at the Department of Commerce. Then uh, I moved to the Department of Agriculture in the Economic Research Service then I moved to the Foreign Agricultural Service. In 1979, I was assigned to Europe, to the U.S. mission to the European Commission. At the time, uh, was the European Community, now it's the European Unity. And stayed in Brussels for six years. Then uh, from there, I was Agricultural Council in Portugal for four years, from 85 to 89. Came back to Washington, worked at the Foreign Agricultural Service, was uh, director for uh, the Trade and Assistance Promotion Officer. Then I was sent to Algeria as agricultural counselor, but the situation, uh, political situation there was very murky, and they evacuated us after four months. After that, I retired. In retirement, I tried to promote Italian-American cultural relationship and translated this Italian novel, the foremost Italian novel, He Promises Poesy. And uh, I was a member of the Holy Rosary Church uh, Parish Council. I was elected president of a couple of Italian-American organizations. And I get busy, and here I am. <laughs> What else would you like to know? Thank you for that concise, quick history. Just gonna switch for a minute, have you since we are the Marconi Project, to have you talk about Marconi. Oh yeah, well, it occurred to me, it's a little out of place maybe, but since it is called the Mar Marconi Project, I think you should uh, mention the shot heard around the world, and that's what I mean. History of the American Revolution, I think it was Emerson who wrote this poem talking about the shot heard around the world, referring to the first shot that went off in the American of independence. And uh, when Marconi was experimenting with his wireless communication telegraphy, he set up his transmitting equipment on one side of a hill and sent his assistant on the other side of the hill. Say, and if he heard the, the signal coming wirelessly, he should shoot the gun in the air. And that's what he did. So he shot the, uh, the heard the signal, shot the, the gun in the hair. And that was really the shot heard around the world, the universe, you might say. Uh, Omer, can you talk to us about when you first came to this community, the Holy Rosary community, mm -hmm. and uh, how you continue to get involved? Well, I had come here once or twice when I was living in Washington, but then uh, at the time it wasn't a very active uh, community, you know, it wasn't a very active church. Then when I really started coming here is when I came back from Europe in 89. 
and uh, it was my spiritual home. I felt comfortable. They spoke Italian, and uh, eventually I became involved with some of the activities. I was elected. Well, at the time we were nominated. We were to the parish council, and. Uh, I've been coming here since then. Uh, I used to come every Sunday. Now that uh, I'm physically handicapped, I come only on special occasions, you know, when somebody takes me there. Oh, and uh, I had to quit the parish council because I couldn't drive at night anymore, you know. But, uh, well, I tried to give a hand uh, to the best I could. What do you think about the latest development, the building project? Well, it sounds great. I don't know all the details, but from what I hear, well, you're going to have new building. I just got uh, what comes closest to having a grandchild. Uh, she's the daughter of a nephew of mine, and mother is breastfeeding her. And I heard Father Angie say that there will be a room here where they can, mothers who are nursing their children, can breastfeed their children, <laughs> children, you know. So I said, well, look at that. That sounds great, you know. Because, as I say, my niece is breastfeeding her daughter, and she she could come to church and be able to breastfeed. But that's one of the things, you know, the, the little things that make you feel at home. Can you take us back to the first time that you were exposed to the Manzoni's book, The Promise of Fidelity? The first time you read The Promise of Fidelity? How old were you? Well, uh, of course, as I mentioned, I was uh, living in Italy. I uh, got my education there, and in the, the Italian high schools, uh, you have to read the book, he promises Percy. That's like uh, a student here who can get through high school without even having their Romeo or Juliet, you know, without having read no Shakespeare. So it is the foremost Italian uh, novel, you know. And uh, I liked it. And uh, when I came to this country, so that the existing translations were really archaic, starting with the title, Promise uh, the Betrothed. Nobody uses that word anymore. And then I, I also explained a few things, like when uh, this fellow is been, the main character in the book has been framed and is uh, forced to run away from uh, the Duchy of Milan that goes to the Republic of Venice. But Venice, uh, the patron saint of Venice is St. Mark, and he asks the, the boatman, he says, is this Venetian territory? And he says, yes, it's land of St. Mark. And Renzo says, that's uh, the Venetian territory. And Renzo says, oh, long live St. Mark. The, the typical American wouldn't know what it means because he was referring to the fact that St. Mark is the protector of Venice. So I translated, instead of saying, don't leave San Marco, I translated, well, God bless Venice, which uh, the typical American would understand. And a lot of other things like uh, your most reverend, uh, your exalted excellency, I just say you, you know. or. Uh, when in Italian you have this different way of addressing people, you have voi, lei, and tu, voi, some sort of respect. But in English you can't, so when I say, he say miss, instead of saying, yeah, you, when you would usually use tu, but in this case he was using voi, so I said, hey, miss, get up, in other words, things like that. Uh, anybody who reads likes it, <laughs> I think, you know. How long did it take you to do the translation? Well, that's difficult to tell because sometimes when I couldn't sleep at night, I would get up and <laughs> translate. Sometimes I went two months without even looking at it. I would say, uh, in terms of bed hour or work hours, I would say about a year. But what took, uh, took the longest was typing it <laughs> because I don't know how to type well. So I wrote it long head and then I had to type. That was the most time consuming period thing. Were you surprised or did you expect the book would 
do better in uh, in America? Would the book would do better? More people would have read the book. Well, uh, I wasn't supposed to really make a, a commercial success out of it. In this country, translations don't go too well unless the book is being translated immediately after it's published in a foreign country. But this was done a long time ago, and uh, it was it was praised by everybody in, in the academic world. It was praised by a lot. But commercially, I haven't sold too many copies. <laughs> Probably, it, it, as I say, it, this, it wasn't done now, uh, like the Leopard, for instance. You know, there was a, an immediate success in this country because the translation is something that happened there. Uh, but uh, when this one... The, well, speaking of that, has this been made into a movie in Italy? Oh, in Italy, they even have it in operas, yeah. They have, it hasn't been made in movies, and they have TV series. Uh, I mean, it's like saying, uh, really, some op- uh, Hamlet, you know. <laughs> that is the equivalent of uh, Shakespeare, really, but Zoni for a title of the, well, modern Italian literature, but all uh, modern Italian is based really on Manzoni's way of writing, because after Dal and after all the Italian become widespread knowledge, but still there had been a lot of uh, localisms. Manzoni revived, he, he went uh, to Tuscany to spend two years there, well, I don't know if it was two years, something like that, so to purify his language, and after that, it became the standard. And even when Leopard, uh, the Leopard was published, the criticism was, oh, it's too much like Manzoni's style. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, and you can say it's really uh, the father of modern Italian. That there was the father of Italian language, but Manzoni purified it, shall we say. It became the standard. Every, or uh, when the, I had to translate a few words and I wasn't quite sure, I would look at the Italian uh, dictionary to see the meaning of the word. And they quoted Manzoni, and said, that's what the Manzoni would say. So it is the the Italian language. Did Manzoni write other uh, other things? Because I'm not familiar with Well, any of yeah, he wrote a lot of things, but uh, they are the really he's a one book man really the other things are read because he wrote the provinces post you know but uh well he wrote the famous uh poem when napoleon died uh that he wrote adelchi and he wrote the uh, la parigis bastigliata uh, when the, the bastille fell but uh, uh it isn't really uh anything that anybody would read if it had been written by him uh, because of Banzoni, you know, because I've been done the provinces post. Do you think the leopard in part got fame too? It was made into a movie and, and an excellent movie yeah. uh, early on or, uh-huh. you know, in the maybe 60s or 70s mm-hmm. with Claudia Cardinal. Do you th- that, that probably maybe helped the leopard in this country, right? Yeah, yeah. In this country, probably it wouldn't go over big. The way, one of the reasons that uh, the book is not known in this country, for one thing, Manzoni equates religion with Catholicism, and that doesn't go over too big in this country. Or he, in a way, was like Mark Twain, you know. Manzoni wrote for a audience which was educated and looked down on the common people. Uh, well, I, I don't mean to use the word, but when, when, so, uh, when the Mark Twain is talking about uh, Huckleberry Fane outsmarting Jim, and uh, I mean Jim outsmarting Huckleberry Fane, and uh, Twain was writing for the people of the time, and he says, when the Huckleberry Fane is outsmarting, he says, oh, you can learn a nigger nothing. Forgive me for using the word. But Zoni was like that. Writing to, about the common people, he had to always apologize for the fact that a simple peasant could be smarter than an aristocrat. And in America, that doesn't go too, too, over too big, you know. Mm-hmm.
And uh, so I had to uh, try to make it understandable to the American audience. But uh, again, uh, it isn't something that the public was waiting for. In the case of The Leopard, they've heard, oh, it's a great book, so people would buy it. It's like the book that has been published with Fury about uh, the, the book that has just come out about uh, the president. Trump. Yeah, but what is it? Sound and, no, fire and fire, Fury. Fire and Fury. Well, anyway, people hear about this and they go and buy the book. But who was talking about the promises possible when they should say nobody was. So they don't buy the book. And Manzoni was, I mean, clearly. Verdi was very impressed by Manzoni oh, yeah. and uh, wrote that Requiem, which is beautiful. The Requiem, yeah, and uh, con uh, described the book as a consolation for all mankind. And uh, again, uh, if you go to Casa Italiana, you know, you have the four statues here, Marconi, Verdi, who else is there, Michelangelo. But in a way, you can say that Manzoni is represented there through Verdi, who calls the book uh, uh, Consolation for All My Guy, one of the greatest work I will come out of human minds. But if you don't teach a book in, the, uh, in high school, people don't, don't know about it, but indirectly, uh, through Verdi, maybe they could know what so. Actually, I've heard, uh, people have told me that uh, before, long before I translated the book, they read the book just because, but, oh, if they could spy something like a record best of Verdi, it must be a good book. And that's how they, but it's, reflected glory in a way. Manzoni must have had quite a send-off. Uh, his funeral must have been also tremendous, oh. a national mm -hmm. outpouring, right? Well, yeah, I, I'm not sure about the funeral, but uh, he was uh, respected uh, nationwide. And so the record best was a year after the funeral. That alone is if you could call part of the funeral in a way, you know, so... But, uh, Omar, I'm going to ask you just to can you describe what you think the story is in The Promise of Fidelity? I mean, just broken down. It's a love story. Well, it's a story of everything, really. The story is set in uh, Northern Italy, but it's really an excuse for to express and describe every human feeling. I asked a friend of mine, can you, can you mention something that uh, he doesn't cover? He says, oh, adultery. And that's probably because his mother left her husband and went to live with another man. That's why he doesn't talk about adultery. But he talks about fidelity, so which is the country of, of adultery. But the story is set in, in Italy, and it's about a girl who was engaged to the, uh, to the main character, Renzo, and when... Uh, one day the local tyrant uh, meets her, wants to uh, talk to her, and she is reluctant. So he, uh, the, the fellow is trying to coerce her, well, to possess her, bets to his cousin that he's going to have anyway. So, uh, so he kidnaps, uh, tries to kidnap her, and uh, that fails because, oh, it's a long story. I have a whole page there, <laughs> somebody. Uh, but then uh, she's eventually kidnapped uh, uh, by another lord, local lord, warlord, and uh, he converts, and Lucia is freed, and uh, then they're uh, finally uh, able to marry. But when, uh, the first one who tried to tell the priest, who told the priest not to marry them, and the priest avoids marrying them, and, but there is this friar, the friar helps them, and finally, they go through the pestilence in Milan. Finally, they get married and they live every after. But as I say, it's really a pretext for him to cover every human situation, every possible, from immigration to, uh, you mentioned it, uh, economics. Oh, but so is quite an economist, by the way, you know. He, uh, any aspect of human nature, really, is described there. If there's a moral, what would the moral of the story be? What's he trying to say? Well, at the end of the book, he says, whether we look for trouble or not, sometimes it comes to you, but confidence in God and faith will, have, will see you through any bad situation. Essentially, that's what uh, he puts at the end of the story. Whether you go looking for trouble or not, it comes to you. But if you have faith, God will help you to overcome every bad situation. I think that's the moral of the story, really. Last question on Manzoni's Promise of Fidelity. Why should somebody read it? Why should a young person today in America or 
Italy it's obviously more, but maybe in America. Why should they pick up the promise of fidelity? If you are a lover of world literature, if people read War and Peace, the Madame Bovary, uh, if you want to know about your Italian heritage, then you should read it. To broaden the knowledge, to know how uh, Italian culture influenced and an influence on uh, American literature. Uh, at one time, when the, uh, I was mentioning some names of these gangsters, they, and a friend of mine told me, oh, that's too much like Chicago. And I said, what do you think we from Chicago at the names of these gangsters? So it is uh, part of your heritage. And I apologize, because I said that was going to be my last question, but let me ask you too. To me, it's a very religious, you can't have that story without the Catholic religion. It's such a big part of the, the story. It's not a religious book, no, no, but, but, but it, is a, um, it is a story in which the Catholic Church plays a preponderant, a, a very large part. Well, uh, I don't know if I gave you that, but Pope Francis, in an interview with an Italian Catholic uh, magazine, uh, praised this book highly, so that everybody should read it. Uh, I understand that every Vatican uh, diplomat and representative, the, uh, as training, they have to read the book if they haven't read it before. I don't know if this is true, but I heard it someplace. It's it's a very religious book. It's oh a, yeah, it's a Catholic book. I mean, it's taken yeah. with a very strong Catholic as, as part of the plot and as part of the story. The main, many of the main characters are the, the well, bishop and the, the village priest. And I guess if you want to call it Catholic, but uh, it's a book about fading God, really. And, and since he was Catholic, uh, and he was, uh, had not been religious in his early life, uh, he was married to a Protestant girl, I believe, uh, and then they then he became a very divine person. It's really fading God. He expressed it through catalysis. And as I said, that's one of the reasons why it's so popular in this country, because it equates catalysis with fading God or with Christianity. Omar, thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about the promise of fidelity and the work and your translation? Yeah, by the book. By the book. Okay. <laughs> it's good, good. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right, we're gonna switch. <laughs> we're gonna switch gears a, a little bit, and if you'll indulge us, talk about your career. And I guess one of my questions is: Was it helpful or harmful, or did it not matter that you were representing the United States in places around the world, but also had a very Italian perspective? Well, if you want to, me to be totally honest. For me, having an Italian background and a foreign accent, that was a handicap, actually, which I had to overcome. And sometimes people ask me, what kind of an American are you? <laughs> I mean, how did you get it? I would say, well, actually, the best guy, the ones who sent overseas to represent the country. But uh, you had to be careful sometimes. I wouldn't accept and I signed with a drone because then people would worry, but who are you? Are you an American or are you Italian? But, uh, I, sometimes it was an advantage when you spoke with the Italians there, they would open up with, with you. But uh, that's one of the reasons I didn't want my children to learn in Italian because I confused their uh, status with mine. As I say, uh, it was a sort of a handicap for me, but uh, I was lucky to have a very open eye minded people who, in spite of accent, sent me overseas, you know, and uh, to represent the country. Omar, can you uh, expound upon what you just said about you not wanting your children to learn Italian? I, it's not that I didn't want them to learn Italian. I thought it was a waste of energy. As a grown-up, if you want to learn Italian, fine. But uh, as a child... Now, there are an awful lot of children uh, of Italian parents who are bilingual between Italian and English, of course, and for them, it's not a great advantage, but uh, to me, seems, in my situation, it seems a waste of energy for my children to learn the guitar. <laughs> if they grow up, they want to learn. But now, when I was overseas, my daughter went to the university, to American University in, uh, in Paris. She's fluent in French, and uh, it's good. But she doesn't use it at work. 
in this country, you don't need a foreign language to, uh, unless you're in the foreign service that they train you to be uh, to be effective in India work. You don't need to know a foreign language. And I was in that situation. I say, why murder these kids? Well, let them talk English. You know. When you were transitioning from the private industry mm -hmm. to government, you were up in New York. Well, I was for Reader's, yeah. Reader's yeah. Digest came down yeah. here. And I'll ask you about Reader's Digest in a minute. But um, did you have any issues getting into the government because of your accent? Yeah, I did have. I first took the foreign, before I went to Reader's Digest, I had taken the Foreign Service examination. And the guy wrote in the report, though he's better equipped than most applicants to, to join the Foreign Service, he retains a certain foreign mannerism. Uh, then uh, he told me I was wearing a dark suit, you know, and he says, oh, I know you Sicilians wear a dark suit. I said, no, I'm not Sicilian, and I'm wearing the dark suit that because the only decent one I have, that's the one I got married in. And, but, but then ended up, many years later, being uh, on the board of examiners of specialists. So uh, I never experienced any real uh, except for this episode, and another time I was in, uh, with a friend of mine, and we were talking Italian, and this fellow was sitting on his front steps there, unshaven, filthy, really looking like a basket case, and he asked, asked us, what language are you speaking? He said the Italian, get out of here! But other than that, <laughs> Then, uh, as I said, they sent me overseas to represent the well, representing to be working for the U.S. government overseas. But they viewed you as representing the U.S. government, so uh, it works both ways. Was there any conflict there that you were overseas representing the U.S. government? Somebody viewed you as an Italian, and maybe the government you were talking with had a different relationship with Italy than the United States? Was there any? Not really. No. The conflict of interest, if you want to know, at one time, we, this government, the U.S., had a, some dispute with the Italians about almonds. And I remember as a child, uh, these uh, these women would crack almonds, you know, for a living. When the, uh, the, and I would look at these poor women who were working on almonds, and I found myself saying, and am I supposed to against those women now? <laughs> but that lasted 10 minutes, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's, but that's one reason I wouldn't accept an assignment in Italy, because they wouldn't know are you American or Italian, you know. One time I had to give a talk in French uh, in Europe, and uh, uh, I spoke French, and then my daughter was in Paris. I asked her, what do you think? She said, no, it was okay, except for the first 15 minutes I thought you were talking Spanish. <laughs> but uh, overall, I mean, uh, it, has been, it was a very pleasant experience, you know. Omer, would you like to say anything about your accomplishments uh, when working for the U.S. government in your career? That well, you, you should ask my, my boss, my former bosses for that. Uh, well, there is an article here uh, where it says I was one of the best diplomats. There were hundreds of diplomats there when uh, I uh, was able to stop, well, to help stop a proposal which would have cost American exporters so it means billions of dollars. So I suppose, oh, and then there is a product called, called, called Gruden Feed. I also had a success in uh, preventing restriction from that. And that, but as I say, you probably should ask my former bosses for that. Out of curiosity though, what characteristics do you think make for a good diplomat? What personality traits? Uh, if you want to be sarcastic about it, it's the ability to talk without saying anything. <laughs> uh, as somebody defined a diplomat, an honest man who is sent overseas to lie on behalf of his country. <laughs> <laughs> Why you have to be able? It's no different from human relations, really. You have to be able to say things 
to convince people. You have to be a salesman to convince people that what's good for you is better for them. Omero, I'd like to take this moment to thank you for talking about your significant contribution to Manzoni's great work, E Promosi Asposi, and your translation into English. People don't know today how influential Reader's Digest was back 30, 40 years ago when I was 15, 10 years old. That was the one of the only magazines we got. The Reader's Digest was all over the place. And it was, I, I think it had back then a, a, a circulation of maybe 30 million or some crazy number. So the fact that you work for Reader's Digest, I just thought maybe you, you could say something because today nobody knows Reader's Digest for nothing. Well, actually, <clears throat> I was in the advertising department. We were doing promotional research, trying to sell advertising, and uh, coming up with information that would help sell advertising. But it was promotional research of the type, if this first, these four guys are first, we must be second. <laughs> and. Uh, you looked for things that helped sell the magazine, but it was an influential magazine. Uh, it has an Italian edition, it has editions. I've lost contact, but uh, the slogan was people have faded Reader's Digest, which was true. A lot of people had faded one. It was a magazine that promoted the goodness in human nature, always looking at the positive side. I haven't read it for a couple of years now, but uh, the jokes were good. And it has this positive outlook on life. It was started by these two people who started working on a basement, you know. Well, what else can I say? It was a good magazine. Yes, yes sir. But I had nothing to do with publication. We are we do promotional research. Okay. Can we talk a little bit about the immigration story of your parents, how they got here, and also perhaps how you ended up back in Italy? And well, <clears throat> my father came when he was a teenager, then uh, started working, well, doing manual work in construction. Then, like most Italian young men of that time, went back to Italy to find a wife, married by mother. And what, what part of Italy was that? What town was that? What, where was your dad Well, from? that's in Abruzzo. It's a village called Secinaro in the province of L'Aquila in the region of Abruzzo. Then he went back and she stayed behind by board. My older brother was born in Secinaro and uh, they joined my father when he was nine months old. That was in 1928. Then, uh, right after my mother arrived, it was the time of El Capone, you know, and the recession, and time was hard. My mother never liked this country, so she went back after she'd been here six years, six years, after she'd been in this country six years, and took me and my brother back to Italy, my father stayed behind, and uh, then he retired. Then the war separated us, you know, it, he served in the American Army, and then uh, he was released because he worked for an a, a industry that was essential to the war effort. And eventually he retired in Italy and died there. How was wartime Italy for you? What were your experiences? Well, I was a child. I really uh, didn't see too much of an action. I see a few bombs falling here and there, you know, but uh, we weren't affected that much directly. Of course, people were being killed elsewhere. We lived about when the, the Allies first came there and they were stopped after Salerno. We lived about 40 miles from uh, the, the front line. But uh, we lived under the German occupation for a while after Italy surrendered, the, the Germans took over. No, those were rough times. Uh, you felt sc scared most of the time, but it was nothing really that atrocious for me directly, you know. But uh, people were dying, were being killed. 
the Germans would take that thing of the Nazis would take that thing of shooting people coming to the house and robbing food, you know, stealing food. And, but it wasn't an easy time. Now, did your mom ever return to the United States? No. She stayed in Italy, and my father re would come every two years. He would get the six, because he had worked in the company for a long time, they gave him six week leave, uh, and he would come every couple of years, back and forth, but she never got back to him. And then he retired in Italy. My father was a saint, really. Your father was a? A saint. And uh, I'll tell you something about my father. Omero is a very unusual name in Italy. I wish was sort of embarrassed uh, uh, of it. My father, well, make a long story short, when I was born, he wasn't looking for a name to give it to his child. And he was reading the Divine Comedy, and he saw this line, that is Homer, Romero, the, the sovereign poet. Now, you think of my father, when they were going past fifth grade, in the middle of the Depression, was in East Chicago, and to amuse his sense, reading the Divine Comedy in Italian, and he saw Romero. And for a while, I was always, then I remember, I don't say, hey, look at that, my father was doing this. So, <laughs> that's the kind of man he was. He could do nothing better than read the Divine Comedy in Italy. Uh, in Italian when you was living in this country. <laughs> and are you saying he's a saint in part because he stayed in the United States, made money, and was good you all back in Italy? Oh, and you were talking about uh, how it was for us. And what. Actually, uh, when my father was in this country, he was getting money for his family, you know, the, but they couldn't send to Italy, so he kept it there, but he was receiving a subsidy for every dependents. So the American government was paying for that. But in Italy, Mussolini considered all the Italian and Americans prisoner of war, so he was giving us subsidies <laughs> because to make up for the money we couldn't get from, from my father, you know. So we received subsidies from the Italian government and the American government. So. <laughs> one of those things. That's great. That's great. If you can have it, take it. You know? <laughs> okay, Omero. The purpose of the Marconi Project is Casa Tayana Social Cultural Center's effort to preserve the memories uh -huh. of Italian American immigrants in the area uh -huh. Uh -huh. for posterity. Is there anything else you would like to say to posterity? To posterity, by goodness. Yes, yeah, so folks, you don't, eat, you and I don't even know. Some of them are just a twinkle in, in the eye of their mothers. About your experience, any further thoughts or stories or anything else you'd like to share? Well, it has been a wonderful experience. America's been good to me, and uh, will continue to be good for many generations. This present time, this is sort of an, uh, an aberration, I think. But basically, we are a nation of immigrants. When Roosevelt, FDI spoke to the Mayflower, uh, to the daughters of the American Revolution, he said, it so happens that through no fault of my own, I descend on both sides of the family from people who came on the May Mayflower. But don't, don't forget, those two were immigrants. So this is a nation of immigrants. And these people try to come to this country and uh, nobody tries to feels obliged to run away because you cannot send the country, you know. So it is a nation of immigrants. It's a beacon of light. The Statue of Liberty symbolizes it. We have our faults, but uh, who doesn't? But the fact is that people try to flock to this country because they have something to offer. We continue to offer it. Um, thank you. I, I don't know of any other questions, but, but thank you, Omar. Thank you. And it's a pleasure. And I will just tell you that the last interview we had was with Angelo Polisi, mm -hmm. and one of the strongest... Well, this is a success story. One, is, one of the strongest is, things he no, said... No, he's a success story. Yeah. 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 Uh, but he said that uh, in all of the world, the best pe people were from Abruzzo. Uh, wow. Uh, He's best people, best people in the world. Uh, uh, in his, he's from there. Right? He's not from there. No, oh. no, his wife's from there. Though. He must have been thinking of me there. <laughs> <laughs>